This video is on articulations, which are joints. Alrighty, so let's first identify the three categories of joints. The first category of joints is which uh, by the way a joint is where two bones meet each other and there are different types of movements between those two bone bones at each different type of joint so the first one is fibrous and this is in general less mobile than the other ones it's going to go from le less motion to more motion as we go down so our first type of fibrous joint is suture. And for each one, I'm just going to provide an example. So an example is the skull. You have different sutures that join different separate bones of the skull together, and we'll discuss those later um, when we get to the nervous system. The second type is syndesmosis. An example of that is the joint between the tibia and fibula or um, ulna and radius. So just as an example, I'll draw a super rough version of a tibia and then a fibula. So the syndesmosis is what joins them, like right in between. So that area that I just colored blue. And then the last type of fibrous joint is a gomphosis. Or gomphoses. And that, the gom, kind of sounds like gum. So that's how you can remember that an example of it is the tooth in, in socket. So that's our first type of articulation or joint. Um, or more like our first category. That's our fibrous joints. Now, that's the one that usually allows for the least amount of motion. Our second category is cartilaginous joints. Oh, you know what? I forgot to add a little. What I want to do is basically identify what makes a fibrous joint a fibrous joint. So I'm going to add in here. Sorry, it's going to be a little bit small, but the bones are united by fibrous tissue. That's what makes a fibrous joint a fibrous joint. So you can probably guess what's going to make a cartilaginous joint a cartilaginous joint. Bones are joined by hyaline or fibrocartilage. So the name makes sense, right? That's what's joining things together is a the cartilage, and then with fibrous joints, it's fibrous tissue. Now, here we actually just have two different types of cartilaginous joints. The first one is 
a symphysis joint. And examples of that are the pubic symphysis. If you remember, we just learned about that in the pelvic, um, when we were learning about the pelvis bone. And another example is intervertebral discs. So those discs in between each vertebrae. Now the second type of cartilaginous joint is a synchondro or synchondrosis or synchondrosis. An example of that is the sternocostal joint, um, which is essentially linked. It, the sternum is linked with to the ribs. Remember, so that's sternum, and then costal is ribs, and it's linked by costal cartilage. That's the thing that we um, drew in that maroon color in the when we were drawing the ribs. All right, so that wraps up our cartilaginous type of joint. Next, we're going to move up to our last type, which is our synovial joint. Or it's our last category, our synovial joints. And this one's actually a little bit different. The bones aren't directly connected. And what makes these synovial joints unique is actually a number of different category or different characteristics. So I'm going to write out these characteristics for us. Let's see. All right. The first characteristic, I'm going to number them because there are six. I know I was using a a B letters up there but we're gonna switch things up here a little bit so the first thing that make the first characteristic of a synovial joint is that it has a joint capsule and it that really holds the joint together and I'm going to show you an example of a synovial joint in a moment, so hang tight. Um, the next thing is that there is a joint cavity. That just means that there's a space in between two surfaces of the bones that are brought together. So for example, in the um, cartilaginous joint, there's like a, they're lined by cartilage, but those bones are essentially directly connected together. With these, there's a joint cavity, which is, means that there's a space in between. The third characteristic of synovial joints is that there is a something called articular cartilage. That lines the different bones. And the purpose of the articular cartilage is essentially to decrease friction. The fourth characteristic of a synovial joint is that there is something called a synovial membrane. And what that synovial membrane does is it lines the joint capsule that we talked about. And it actually produces the fifth characteristic of a synovial joint, which is synovial fluid. And what that synovial fluid does in the joint space between the two bones is it really serves as a lubrication for the joint. 
So I'm just going to draw a fun little arrow coming from our um, synovial membrane to synovial fluid to remind us that the synovial membrane produces the synovial fluid. And then the last characteristic of the synovial joint is that it has something called bursas. And they, surprise, surprise, also um, decrease friction, but they, like the purpose or location of bursas is very strategic in that it decreases friction where there are muscles and tendons that are moving over bones. So I'm going to say decrease friction with tendons and muscles. The abbreviation for muscles is MM. Alrighty, so now we covered all of these different categories of articulations or joints. We covered fibrous, cartilaginous, and synovial. And I gave you the different types of these first two. And then what I did for this last one, the synovial joints, is that I talked about the different characteristics. So I'm just going to label that here. Now what I want to do is I want to take a closer look at synovial joints because there are a bunch of different types of synovial joints. So let's dive a little bit further into that. We're going to cover types of synovial joints. Alrighty. So our first one is a gliding, also known as a plane joint. And so for each of these type of joints, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, first provide examples of different joints that are fall within each category. And then I'm going to give a little description and then I'm going to tell you what or how many axes that these joints move in. Okay, so I'm going to kind of color code those to make sure that we're kind of keeping it clear in our heads. So let's get started. Alrighty. So for the gliding and plane joints, a few examples are intercarpal joints or be the joints that are between your carpal bones. Same thing as intertarsal and your acromioclavicular joint, which is the joint between your acromion. Remember that part of the scapula, the end of the scapular spine that kind of sticks out where the shoulder joint is and where that bone forms a joint with the clavicle. Now, a description of that is essentially for the, as the name suggests, the glide is limited. And for these, as if you can like park, picture the carpal bones, all of them are packed really tightly and they're surrounded by ligaments. And for these gliding and plane synovial joints, they are multi-axial, meaning that they can move in multiple different axes. Sweet. So let's move to the next type. The next type is our hinge joint. There's a little bug that just landed on the paper. All right. So an example of these joints, these are actually the most common ones in the body. So we have our elbow, our knee. This little moss loves us. Okay. Knee, 
and our interphalangeal joints, which are also known as IP joints. Basically how these work is they're like a door hinge, hinging across each other. And they are uniaxial, meaning they only want to move, which meaning they only move in one axis, which makes sense, right? Because that's just like a door hinge. Our next type of synovial joint is a condyloid joint. A few examples of that are the MCP joints, which is the metacarpal phalangeal joints, as well as the radiocarpal. And what's unique about these is that essentially there's a little shallow depression surround or that forms a joint with a rounded structure so go ahead and take a look at the how those bones are shaped both on your models and in the textbook to make sure that you can see how they look so we can kind of get a better idea of what a condyloid joint looks like so there's a shallow depression and a rounded structure that form a joint together. And this is biaxial just because of the shape of the bones that form this joint. It can move in two different axes. Next we have our pivot joints. Examples of these are C1 on C2 or the atlas on the axis. Remember we talked about um, rotation at that joint is really important because of the shape of those bones. And actually about 50% of your rotation range of motion in your neck should come from that joint. So that should just show you how significant it really is. Um, your radial ulnar joint is also a pivot joint as, as well. And what makes a pivot joint a pivot joint is that it requires rotation around an axis. And since you're just rotating around an axis, that is uniaxial. Our next type of synovial joint is our ball in socket joint. Examples of those are our hip and our shoulder. And Essentially, you can just picture it. It's like a ball, like my fist, in a little socket, like my hand, and it can move around within that. So, for that reason, what's unique about it is that it, these joints have the greatest range of motion. And ROM is just an abbreviation for range of motion. Because of that, the ball and socket shape, it, it is multi-axial, meaning it can move in multiple axes. And our last but not least joint is our synovial joint, is our saddle joint. Examples of those are the first CMC joint, that's the carpometacarpal joint, and then also the sternoclavicular 
clavicular. Now this is a little bit different because remember up here we talked about the acromioclavicular, here we're talking about sternoclavicular where the sternum forms a joint with the clavicle. So make sure you don't get those confused. What's unique, unique about this is that it's essentially saddle shaped exactly as the name suggests. So one surface of a bone acts as like the saddle and then the other surface of the bone almost acts like something sitting over it almost like here let me see if i can do it here it's kind of hard i wish my wrist bent in more ways so you could see it but it's almost kind of like this that wasn't the greatest demonstration but you know we're doing what we can in a video um and this is by axial all right so that covers our different types of synovial joints and what we're going to do next is I just want to show you an example of one of these synovial joints just so you can get a better picture of it. Um, this is also a pretty important joint in the body. It's our knee joint, so that's what we're going to cover next. So we're going to draw our knee joint. And that's that example of that hinge type synovial joint. So just like always, now we're going to get back into drawing a picture. So let's see, we're going to look at anterior view of a right knee. So let me draw the bones out first. We've got our femur. And then I'm gonna create again a little bit of space between the two bones, but then we have our tibia. And then we also have our fibula. Alrighty, now we got our bones, we're rolling. So what makes a hinge joint is this surface right here, not actually the patella. Um, the patella forms a joint with the femur forming its own joint, which is called the patellofemoral joint. Um, but that's not exactly what we're looking at right now. But what I wanna do regardless is I want to draw the patella in. And I'm going to draw some attachments to it. Alrighty. So let's get started. Um, I want to take a look at this joint just because there are a couple of things that make it a little bit unique. The first one is something called a meniscus. So you actually, oops, let me label medial and lateral. If you forget, our, remember our, fem, our fibula is it was lateral, our tibia is it was medial. And we are going to label our medial meniscus. And I'm going to put it right here. It is a source of like shock absorption and protection for the knee joint, which is remember the femur against the tibia. Now we're also going to have a lateral meniscus on the lateral side. And there are some differences between the menisci, but just don't worry about it for now. It's beyond the scope of this course. So that, that's, those are some important things or parts of the knee joint. And then we have two, actually four ligaments that we're going to cover. The first one is our ACL, anterior cruciate ligament, that goes across like this. 
most of you has prob have probably heard about injuries to the ACL. You also have something that goes right posteriorly to it, and what do you think that's going to be called? You got it, the posterior cruciate ligament. So let me use a good color for this. I'll use green. It's going to come posteriorly, so I'm not, you're just going to be able to see it poking through there on the other side. So that's our PCL posterior cruciate ligament and those serve as stabilizing forces for the knee joint now there are a few other ligaments that are embedded in what we call the joint capsule just forming a capsule for stability around the knee joint and you know the other perk of the capsule is that it holds that synovial membrane and synovial fluid inside to make sure that things are um, moving very well without friction. So we have the medial collateral ligament and let's draw that in. That goes from about right here to here. And that's kind of embedded in the joint capsule. And the acronym is MCL. And then if we have that, what do you think we're gonna have on the other side? That's right, the lateral collateral ligament. And um, like I said, the MCL is embedded into the joint capsule. The lateral collateral ligament actually looks a little bit more like a distinct ligament that's not quite embedded. So you can just keep that in mind. So what I'm doing here is I am drawing excess or extra attention to this knee joint because it's a really good example um, of how complicated a joint can be with a bunch of different ligaments and things stabilizing it but it's also very important because a lot of injuries happen here so since a lot of you are going to become medical professionals or already are and are looking to you know further those careers it's important because you're probably going to encounter someone with some sort of knee injury or you may have a family and friend with one and you may even have one yourself. So um, something that's just like a fun fact, you can actually injure a bunch of these things. You can injure your meniscus, your ACL, and your MCL and that's actually known as an unhappy triad. So that can happen um, oftentimes in, in sporting events. Now, there are a few last things that I want to identify here, um, but I don't want it to disrupt the other structures that we've already drawn. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to just color in the outline of it so we can kind of keep it separate from other things. So let's do, I'm trying to pick colors that won't really mess with other things. Alrighty. So, uh, more superiorly, what attaches to our patella, I'm going to highlight in this like nice deep teal. That is our quad tendon or quadriceps tendon. And that attaches your quad muscle, which is up and up on your femur and part of it attaches to your pelvis but it attaches that to your kneecap or your patella and then what attaches your kneecap or patella down to the tibia is um 
people some people call it patellar ligament because it attaches the patella to the tibia so it's technically a ligament because ligaments attach bone to bone and tendons attach um, muscle to bone but it's actually more commonly known as patellar tendon so I'm going to call it that just know that if you see patellar ligament it's the same thing so this kind of completes all the different structures in the knee joint that I want you to know to make sure that you're prepared in case you encounter someone with a knee injury or any sort of knee pathology. Now we've covered all of these different types of joints and the next thing I wanna talk about is movement and kind of movement terms so we can be able to discuss movements in an anatomical way and know what we're talking about. We're gonna talk about movement terms And what I want to point out before we kind of get started is when we're referring to all of these different movements and really anything in anatomy, we're going to be talking about things in terms of anatomical position. So I'm just putting a little star here saying anatomical position because what I'm going to be talking about with some of these different movement terms is different planes that the motions take place in. And remember, you can, if you need a refresher, you can go back to one of those first lectures where we talked about the movement planes, like frontal or coronal, sagittal, etc. And just review that to make sure that you're familiar with what planes we're talking about, because if not, you're just going to get a little bit lost. So let's start out with one of our most basic movement terms. We're talking about flexion and extension. So I'm gonna set this up using color coding, kind of like what we did with the joints earlier. First, what I'm gonna tell you is what type of, what, what body parts move in this way. And then I'm going to tell you what plane they move in, and then I'm going to kind of explain the motion itself. For flexion extension, we're talking about either the spine or extremities. Some part of an extremity, whether that be fingers, elbows, or knees, etc. And for all of those, they're going to be moving in the sagittal plane when they're doing flexion and extension. And I'm going to describe this for both the spine and for the extremities. So for the spine, it's going to be essentially anterior and posterior movements. And so I'm gonna write A slash P movements. You know, it's also gonna be the same thing for extremities. You are gonna be moving them anteriorly and posteriorly. So take note of that, but I'm gonna give you an extra little description for extremities. So for extremities, you can think about flexion as decrease in an angle and you can think about extension as increase in an angle and what i mean by that is if you take a look at my finger um i am flexing my interphalangeal joints and I'm decreasing the angle between them. So if the angle is here and here, and let's talk about like my DIP joint, the distal interphalangeal joint between my distal phalanx and my middle phalanx, you can see my knuckle right here is the axis of rotation. And as I'm flexing it, I'm decreasing that angle. And as I'm extending it, I'm increasing that angle. So that's what we talk about when we talk about angles. Now, the next motion is kind of a little bit of a variation of the flexion. It's 
called lateral flexion. And it's also called side bending. Now this happens in the spine. And the plane that it takes place in is the coronal plane. Oh, you know what? One, one other thing I forgot to describe for the flexion and extension with the spine. Um, if you're confused about that, the anterior and posterior movements, what you can do is you can bring your chin to your chest. And what that does is that's cervical spine flexion or flexion at your neck. And then if you look up towards the ceiling, almost as if you're going to do like a back bend, um, that's cervical spine extension. So I forgot to describe that, but that's what we mean when we're talking about flexion and extension of the spine. You can also practice that flexion and extension of your extremities by like bending your elbow and decreasing the angle at your elbow joint, or you can increase it and extend your elbow. So what I encourage you to do to, when we're reviewing all of these movement terms is try it on your own body so you get kind of a sense of what we're talking about and it'll help you really memorize it and kind of lock it in. So anyway, getting back to lateral flexion, it happens in the spine and in the coronal plane and um, I'm gonna basically just write an example here. Um, how this works is you can bend your cervical spine towards oops to, towards that should be an A um, the right or the left so how that works is you can essentially take your ear and bring it to your shoulder and that's lateral flexion or side bending our next movement term is abduction and adduction. I'm just going to underline ABD and ADD. When I'm talking to another colleague about this, I'll actually say abduction or adduction because when you say abduction or adduction it really sounds very similar so that's how you can kind of differentiate that if you're talking about it in clinical terms to a colleague now for this it occurs in extremities and it also just like lateral flexion it occurs in the coronal plane. And an example of this is essentially medial or lateral motions, or not really an example, a description of this is medial and lateral motions. And if you're confused about any of these motions, what I encourage you to do is look up like YouTube videos of people doing them to make sure. Sometimes I'll have people just check multiple sources to make sure that, you know, you're looking at a reputable video. Um, the, that's something if you want to actually see a person actively moving, but your book also has really good pictures if you want some extra info. So how I like to talk about this is if you do like a jumping jack or you um, make like a snow angel, as you're lifting your arms above your head in that like sweeping motion, you're abducting them or abducting them away from midline, moving laterally. And then for adduction, you're moving them towards midline. Um, so I'm going to kind of add that in. So away from or towards 
midline. So again, for that jumping jack or snow angel, you're bringing your arms away from midline, you're going up over your head, you're doing abduction, and then as you bring them back towards midline, towards your torso or your chest, um, you are adducting them. Our next movement term is circumduction. And this happens at your extremities, different, various different places within extremities, but still extremities. And this is going to occur in multiple planes. And it occurs in multiple planes because essentially it's motion in a circular motion, you know, just like the name suggests, circumduction. Um, and in that circular motion, the proximal end is, flick, is fixed. And the distal end moves. So basically, if you kind of um, move your arm around in a circle and just kind of let it rotate in a circle, your proximal end at your shoulder joint is fixed and your distal end, meaning like your hand, is moving. Or your, you could think about it as your elbow as well. Um, so that's what circumduction is. Definitely take a look in your book and you can also look up videos of circumduction as well. Oftentimes people do this like hip circumduction as a compensatory motion if they are lacking strength or range of motion in other areas. Um, but it can also be used in different exercises and things like that. Now the next thing, we're, the next motion we're going to go over is internal and external rotation. And this actually only takes place at the shoulder and hip. It occurs in a transverse plane. And I'm gonna describe internal rotation first. So I'm gonna actually abbreviate it as IR. And when you're internally rotating, take your shoulder for example, you're gonna bring the anterior, I'm gonna abbreviate anterior with AT surface toward midline. Now don't get this confused with abduction or adduction. Um you remember what plane we're working in. So abduction and adduction is working in the coronal plane and it does kind of um, talk to moving medial and laterally and away from and towards midline. And internal rotation and external rotation do the same thing, but remember we're moving in a different plane. So definitely take a look at your book and videos for this, but external rotation I'm going to abbreviate as ER, does the opposite. So the it's going to bring the anterior surface away from midline. So let's keep going with our different terms. I'm just going to add in another paper here. The next thing we're going to discuss is supination and pronation. That's our next movement.
this will occur at the forearm only. It will occur also in the transverse plane, just like the last one we talked about. And remember, we're talking about anatomical position here. So go ahead and sit in anatomical position or stand or whatever. Um, and can you see that your palm is moving, is facing anteriorly? And that's how it should be. So that's our anatomical position. Now, if you stay in anatomical position, but you just rotate your forearm, so your palm faces posteriorly, what you just did is pronation. And if you bring your palm from facing posteriorly to facing anteriorly, that's supination. So let's write that down for ourselves. Supination is palm moves from posterior to anterior. Pronation, oops, palm moves from anterior to posterior. So just a few more motions we have to still review. We're almost getting there. Alrighty, I'm gonna go ahead and take my other sheet away. And we're just gonna continue here. Our next motion is door, oops, D-O-R. Sorry, my R looks a little weird, but that's D-O-R-S-I, flexion, and plantar flexion. So this occurs only at the ankle. It occurs in the sagittal plane. And I'll write a description of both of these. I'm just going to write it out, not necessarily in an anatomical way, but just to help you remember. Um, so for dorsiflexion, you can bring your nose towards your toes. And that, or excuse me, <laughs> I said that in the wrong way. You can bring your toes towards your nose. So bring your toes up and lifting them up in the air towards your nose, that's dorsiflexion. And then plantar flexion is basically as if you're going to press a gas pedal. So bring your toes away from your nose. Now one last movement that we have to discuss is inversion and eversion. That occurs only at the tarsal bones. It takes place in multiple planes. And I'll again write out a description of both of them. So for inversion, you basically tilt your sole of your foot towards midline. And then for eversion, it's the opposite. You tilt sole away from midline. So that covers all the different motions that I want to discuss that occur at the different joints that we were we discussed today. 
Now, the last thing I want to do is write a few different things we're going to talk about in terms of joints and um, body parts in general that I didn't mention before. So the first term I want to discuss is ipsilateral. That means same side. An example of this is basically like if someone has pain at their right shoulder, it can refer or cause like pain to travel down to their right elbow. So how we would talk about that is we'd say, oh, like a patient has pain in their right shoulder and it travels to their ipsilateral elbow. So we're talking about the elbow that's on the same side of the thing that we just talked about. Now, what we can also say is the opposite of that is contralateral. And that means the opposite side. So an example of that is say someone has like right-sided hip pain and they're walking funny. So it ends up leading to knee pain on their left side. We can say their right hip pain is leading to contralateral knee pain because it's knee pain on the opposite side of what we were talking about. The last thing I want to discuss is the word bilateral. And that means both sides. So let's say both of uh, someone's elbows, like their right and left elbow, both hurt. Well, then we would say someone has bilateral elbow pain. Okay, so that covers our, or that's the end of our articulations lecture where we covered the different types of joints and then the different movements that occur at those joints.